Call sign is AD6VI. I'm the president of the Palomar Club this year, which I'm fortunate that people did allow me to do that. It is an honor. It's also a little bit of a task. I want to welcome you all aboard. We're doing an abbreviated uh, version of this, of the announcements. And uh, moving right into the program. We are going to have a program this evening called, or titled, I Have My License, Now What? And it's an opportunity to find out little different aspects of amateur radio and maybe some practical how-to. Yeah. The Power Amateur Radio Club is currently the largest club in San Diego County. We do meet here the first Wednesday of each month. I want to invite you every month to uh, join us. We have uh, two major programs we go through for the year. The first one being Field Day, which is coming up, I believe, on June 23rd and 24th this year to be the uh, last weekend of June, or is it last, or, yeah. Anyways, that is an opportunity to go out and get on the air. If you do not have an HF ticket yet, you're, you're just a tech, come out, we'll get you on HF anyway, it's an opportunity. The uh, other thing we have is our annual picnic, and uh, in between, we do our best to help out all amateurs in the neighborhood, and do what we can to, to support the amateur community. Okay. We're going to move on to the program, and we're going to move sweeping around the room, but yeah, I guess we got people pretty much in order. Our first up is going to be Pat Bensel, W6MHZ. He is the current section manager of the uh, San Diego section of the ARRL. Pass the mic. Thank you. Uh, most of you have seen the fine magazines, even here in the uh, room, QST. And you think, well, that's what ARL does, is publish QST. Yes, they do. But they also do a lot more. Uh, what do you get? Uh, your current membership for ARL might sound a little pricey, $39 or $36 for seniors. But when you find out what you get for your ARL membership, uh, you'll be realize what a bargain it is. Uh, you get representation to the FCC. Uh, and also the government agencies, uh, Congress and such, lobbying so that we can have the best interest of ham radio put forth and have the uh, uh, various um, laws like PRB1 and all the rest of the, we're, we're currently fighting a tenant ordinance problems. Uh, that's all helped out by the ARL. Uh, of course, QST, also they make a whole series of uh, technical books and books for all aspects of the hobby. Uh, of course, the ARL handbook and uh, antenna books, uh, just any, about any subject you can think of, uh, ARL has a book on it. Uh, they have an outgoing QSL bureau. If you work DX, you don't want to be sending their cards uh, all over the world uh, individually, so you can box them all up and send them out to uh, ARL headquarters in Newington, they'll ship them out for you for a very, very minor charge. Um, they have technical information services. If you have a problem that you can't figure out or none of your friends can, you can call into uh, headquarters and they'll work on it for you. Uh, they have a members, a wonderful website, but they also, as being a member, you have access to a members only part of the website with a wealth of information on that. Uh, they have quite a few operating awards, of course, we'll hear a little bit later about the, those awards from Harry, but uh, uh, among them, DXCC, WAS, Worked All States, and uh, VUCC, uh, VHF, UHF Century Club. Uh, a lot of contests, almost every weekend there's a contest somewhere for just about all modes and interests, uh, anywhere from 160 up to the uh, microwave bands. Uh, for those that need to get uh, your code speed up, W1AW still has uh, full code practice uh, several times a day. Uh, of course, they sponsor the ARES, Amateur Radio Emergency Service, which we'll hear all about. Uh, they do do VECs for testing, although here in town we use the Sandark VEC. Uh, regulatory Information Branch, information on the FCC and all the regulatory questions are available from them. Uh, they have volunteer counsel for uh, lawyers to help you out when you get in uh, uh, problems as such as our big antenna disputes going on here in town. Uh, they have a special equipment insurance program so you can uh, insure all your equipment. I know I never could insure all my equipment, but uh, uh, that would cost me a million dollars in a policy a year. Uh, 
Uh, also, if you do the internet a lot, they have a wonderful email forwarding. Uh, you can get an at ARL, usually like your call sign at ARL.net, uh, free of charge, which makes it real easy to tell people your email address. And then, of course, the field organization, which uh, consists of uh, the section manager and all the people who help them out, uh, help out, will help you in any way. So, I guess that's enough about the ARL. Thank you. Got a queue over here. My name's Tuck, call sign MZ6T, and I am the ARES section emergency coordinator at this time. Now, in about 90 days, you don't want that because it's going to be glare. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you don't want, no, no, you don't want this. Anyway, one month from today, I take his, where did he go? His job. I'll be your new section manager. I was section manager for four years. Back from what, 98 to 2002, and then vice director from 2002 to 2005. And uh, so I'm going back a little bit here. Anyway, I'm here to talk to you about ARES. How many of you have, are members of ARES right now? Okay, I'm going to ask you a few quick questions. <laughs> Tell me what ARES is. Very good. Amateur Radio Emergency Service. As Pat has already told you, we are a subsidiary of the ARRL, American Radio Relay Label. How many districts are there in the San Diego section? How many? Five. 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 Name them. Dave, you don't name them. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> and Harry, you don't. One, two, three, four, and five. One, two, three, four, and five. Well, close. No. Your Northern District, which Palomar Club is a part of. Your DEC for the Palomar, or for the Northern District, is Tony Doan. Okay, Eastern District is Rich Bicycle, covers all of East County. Southern, down there by where I live, National City, Chula Vista, Coronado, Cerro is a big help to the Southern District. And then uh, Central District, which covers the city of San Diego, and that's uh, Stogie Panger, KG6JCW. Now I'm forgetting one. Imperial. Imperial. Oh, yeah, you weren't supposed to say it. Anyway, Imperial, out there on the other side of the mountain, okay? We do have people on the other side of the mountain. And uh, they are run by Rory Bowers, N6CKS. Great group of people. I enjoy working with them. I'm going to go ahead and make this announcement now. In a couple months, you're going to have a new SEC. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce you now. There's a couple things that I'm working on that I want to see come to fruition first. But the new section emergency coordinator is going to be Mitch, K6BK. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Let me tell you, this job can be very frustrating at times. Okay. A couple things that are happening in ARS at this time. We've got a couple memorandums of understanding. One I'm very happy with, Mike, N6GEM. He's with San Diego CERT. And we've got a working relationship with San Diego CERT. We're going to help them. They're going to help us. We're going to allow them, or encourage them, not allow them, encourage them to come with us and learn how to communicate the way it should be. A lot of these are people brand new that have never held a radio in their hands. They're going to teach them all the technical stuff, what they're supposed to do. We're going to teach them how to communicate. Okay? Good system. San Diego, we're also going to have communications with the hospitals. When phone lines go down, we're going to send hands into the hospitals. We're going to provide communications from the emergency room to the operating rooms, wherever it may need be. Because you know, you've got to have communications in a hospital. We've got a memo you with the uh, El Cajon Helps Club, where we've got an EOC set up there. So we've got a lot of stuff that is going on. Public service events. How do we get our training? Public service events. We've got Special Olympics. How many of you have ever worked with the Special Olympics? Dave? Harry? All these. We go out there and we provide communications. I know he's going to cut me off here before long. We're going to provide communications to make sure those participants are safe. If something happens to them, we're going to get them emergency medical care. What else? CDF. Miramar. He, he wants to make sure we have the Miramar Air Show. Last year was very, very, a lot of fun. We were up there for three days. And one day in particular, we had a four-year-old child that had gotten lost. By with our rovers out there and our communicators, 
we were able to help find that kid within 20 minutes. And we're very proud of that. Okay? CDF, uh, Special Olympics. How many of you like going to the beach? Nobody likes going to the beach? All right. We've got a thing we call I Love a Clean San Diego that's coming up April 29th. I'm going to need about 40 communicators. You go out there and you talk on the radio and you get to see the beautiful beach alongside. Okay? So think about that. I would encourage you to get involved in the ARES. We meet the set normally the second Saturday of every month at uh, Giovanni's, Claremont Mesa Boulevard and Ruffin Road. Seven bucks for an all-you-can-eat buffet. This month, and, this month is different. Yeah, this month is different. We're going to meet on the third uh, Saturday as well as in May because we've got public service events. You heard Dick talk about the uh, run that's going to be on the north uh, second Saturday. You got something else coming up in May? Well, I'm going to do public Oh, you're going to do that. Okay. You don't do the whole thing. All right. <laughs> hey, you get me talking. I you know. So, well. Anyway, he's saying to wrap it up. Anyway, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure. Hi, I'm Terry Runyon. I'm with Reese's. What you call sir? Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. We're the radio amateurs. K3PXX is me. K6JCC is the Reese's. Oh, here we go. If you like to play with toys, we have 22 radios in that truck. Uh, what Reese's does, we back up law enforcement. Uh, when there's a major problem, there aren't enough law enforcement people out there to handle it. That's where we come in. That's why we have a license in the first place, if you remember on your test. I can't remember. It was too long ago. But... Uh, 22 radios in here, if you walk in the back door, on the right hand side are all amateur radios. Left hand side, all police radios. You name it, we have it. CHP, helicopters, uh, all the planes that drop the retardant. All the radios are in the truck, that's our portable dispatch center. We take taking it out for the CHP to use, for the sheriff's department to use. They send their dispatcher out. Uh, this truck was built but mostly for CDF. California Department of Forestry, there's a big conference room back here, radio room up here. Our people drive these trucks, we take care of the trucks, we run the radios in the trucks. You need a uniform to be in races because you're not going to get behind police barricades, whatever. They don't want untrained people in a really nasty fire zone or any bad situation. You need the training. We have, we're dealing, we're not amateur radio operators when we get called in for races. We're professional radio operators. You have to know how the state does it, how the federal government does it. County provides all the training. They provide all the radios. Luckily, there are a lot of people in government in this county that have, have a hemp license in their pocket, and they know the importance, so they get us whatever equipment we need. If you're interested, see me afterwards. Uh, there's a lot to learn if you want to be in races because you're going to be a professional radio operator working law enforcement people. Hmm? Oh, general meeting is next Monday night. If you can find HRO, you can find where we are. The Emergency Operations Center for the County is in Claremont Basin Boulevard, my own Claremont Basin. We're on the first floor. 911 people are upstairs. Part of your training, you have to sit up there and see how they work things, so you can speed things up if you have to. So see me afterwards. That's what time the meeting? Hmm? What time the meeting? What time? meeting is at 6.30 next Monday night. See me and I will tell you how to get there and what to do. I'm David Doan, KC6YSO, and I'm the uh, Public Service Coordinator for the Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Do you like to get outside and play radio with other hams? Do you like a challenge? Do you like to help other people in your community? Well then you should try public service events. Amateur radio is one of the very few hobbies in which uh, you can pursue your hobby and return something to the, to the community. That's part of the service exists. Is not just so that we can have fun, but so that we can help out when the need arises. Public service communications 
is uh, one way to do that, and it's also one way to get uh, training uh, for doing communications when you do have emergencies. Public service events are generally out in the uh, 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 field somewhere. You're not operating from your home. You're using portable equipment. You're working with other agencies. So all of these things give you uh, uh, good practice for emergencies. What kind of events have we got? Well, we've already talked about several of them. The uh, Lake Hodges uh, Trail Run, which is a week from Saturday, is uh, one of several events of this type that we uh, provide communications for. Uh, these are uh, long distance runs where um, runners run on a, uh, a trail, check into various aid stations, and our job is to uh, uh, provide any uh, uh, logistic communications, emergency communications, should anybody get hurt, and also to track the runners to see that nobody uh, gets lost. The Lake Hodges uh, race is in the daytime along the shore of Lake Hodges, and you never get more than a uh, stone's throw from civilization, so it's a very low pressure event, which makes it a very good um, uh, training event for um, uh, any kind of communications, and particularly training for the more complicated trail runs. We've got another trail run um, uh, coming up in May which is on uh, May 13th. It's called the Pacific Crest Trail. This one is a 50-mile run. It's in the Laguna Mountains, and uh, the terrain is rough enough and uh, lonely enough that, in this case, we do start becoming a very important uh, uh, safety measure uh, for the uh, runners. The aid stations are about seven miles apart, and um, we do have to... Uh, keep good track of runners. If somebody gets lost, we have to know about it so that uh, proper measures can be taken to find them. And then in November, or I'm sorry, in October, uh, 21st and 22nd, which is the weekend after the air show, is the San Diego 100 mile uh, event. Now this is a 100 mile trail run. This is not a relay. Each runner runs the full 100 miles. The event uh, takes something like 30 to uh, 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 32 hours, runs all night, and uh, as you can imagine, this is uh, where um, safety measures really, really uh, become important. Mark your calendar for that one. That, that, that is a uh, uh, very important event. Uh, other um, Public service events, Tuck's already mentioned, the I Love Clean San Diego Beach Cleanup on April 29th. Special Olympics, the basketball tournament is April 1st and 2nd. This is at uh, uh, University of San Diego and uh, points in that immediate neighborhood. They uh, need a number of gyms to handle that, so uh, while it's headquartered at uh, USD, it spraddles out to various rec centers. And then the Greater Games at San Diego State is on June uh, 3rd and 4th. To keep up with what's going on in public service, you need to uh, read the Aries Alert, which is the Aries newsletter. It's available online. It's at www.qsl.net slash sdgarrl, and then click on the alert button. It has all kinds of good stuff in it, and uh, including the uh, public service calendar. If you're interested in public service events, please, uh, please see me after the meeting. Good evening, I'm Jim Cooper in E6L. I'm going to talk to you about QRP. Uh, QRP is low power operation, and QRP by itself means any sort of activity that's under 5 watts of uh, power. Usually it's on the HF bands, it can be everywhere, anywhere else. Uh, on here, it's put down as extreme low power operation. Well, there are people who do QRPP, which is power less than a watt, and then there are people who do even less, where they try to see how far they can work on the milliwatt. And there is a uh, informal ward miles per milliwatt, so it's there. The thing that about Q QRP is that you can work any mode and any frequency. It requires patience. You do not have the power. You're not going to bust the pile up with the big guns. It's also, a lot of it is portability. As you can see here, uh, um, 
a minimal antenna and a rig. I've just set it up here, no problem. Could be on 20 meters. Don't know if I'd work anybody, but I could be on it. The many types of different rigs that you can have. Uh, there are commercial rigs. We have uh, two varieties here. Yesu makes a nice popular one, the FT817. Uh, Glenn brought in his uh, ICOM 703. Both of these run about uh, five watts. They're full featured rigs. Uh, the FT817 goes from 160 meter up to 70 centimeters. And I use it as my primary rig, both in the house and uh, when I go to activities. There are kits that are available. You can build your own stuff. We have some beautiful kits here. Uh, Ralph, and I'm not remembering your call sign, so I apologize, brought in a very nice uh, KX1 from El Elacraft. And uh, those are very nice. The older brother of the uh, KX1, the K2, is considered perhaps the best QRP rig, and the receiver of it is as good as anything can buy elsewhere. Other rigs I have here is kits. You're not limited to just the ordinary uh, voice and uh, CW modes. Here's the PSK31 uh, rig that will do digital modes, run two watts. I also have a uh, complete transceiver here for 40 meters that will put out about 3 watts and a, 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 a 2 meter single sideband transceiver that puts out only a few milliwatts because it was designed to work as an IF rig for uh, microwave equipment. The One of the things there is there is a kit called the Rock Mic. It puts out half a watt, it's only like $25 and it's a complete uh, 20 meter transceiver. Does not put much power, it has limitations. But it's an excellent first kit. Antennas, QRP is a lot, is portable, you have antennas that you have to do. This one here is a 20 meter antenna, a mag loop, and uh, you can take it out, set it up, get going any place. For QRP, you want to have the best antennas you can. Uh, many element Yagis are the best, whatever you can put up. Uh, for portable operation, you have to have something you can carry with you. Portable antennas are a compromise. The, this is a compromise antenna, but it is portable and it does get out. Got 15 countries on during the test, uh, DX test, and my biggest problem was trying, uh, trying to hear the foreign countries under all the S9 Plus uh, Americans. Uh, in short, I would say that QRP is a lot of fun. I would not recommend going QRP for your first HF rig. It does take a little effort. Get a 100 watt rig and the big antennas you can. Um, just try to do the best you can and, and go. If you have questions afterwards, please come by and ask there. I have a handout and uh, be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm Pat, WA6MH, that again, and this time we're going to talk about homebrew. Uh, what is homebrew? Building what you cannot buy. Maybe you can buy it, but maybe you want to build it cheaper. Maybe you just want to have the sense of accomplishment and pride in making something out of a bunch of parts. And that's what we have here today. We have 50 years of homebrew here on the table. Um, where do you get a project? Uh, QST, the Arrow Handbook, is just chock full of various projects. Some of them are uh, quite advanced, but some of them are also quite easy. Uh, here's an example of a project everybody needs in their house. This is, uh, I didn't build this one. Uh, this was got at the last park auction, but it is a digital clock that somebody made. Uh, looking at it, it looks like it's the late 70s. And, uh, of course, everyone needs to know what time it is for UTC. Um, of course, there's different methods. You'll see some beautiful uh, surface mount and uh, other uh, type of uh, mounting uh, on Jim's table here. Jim has done a spectacular job on mounting and uh, uh, homebrewing various things. Uh, and uh, sometimes you can use some parts that uh, were doing something else. Uh, the most complicated project over here is a 1296 transverter that's using some parts that were in former Qualcomm units that have been modified for the, uh, the bands. 
Uh, I, this particular project, this 1296 transverter, uh, I've been working on now for a couple of years, and uh, it's actually almost working now. So <laughs> I do, I can receive, and I do have a transmit signal, but uh, needs a little more hoof out. But we're we're still working on it, and we're going to close it all in the box. Uh, this is another item which is currently or never been available. Uh, this is the only one of these in the world. This is a 10 gigahertz handy talkie. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see that back in the early days of 10 gigahertz, everybody used wideband with gun flexors, so it was a little easier. Now everybody uses sideband on 10 gigahertz, and it's kind of obsolete, but uh, it still works. Um, this item here. I found, I wish I had built this thing, because this is an incredible piece of craftsmanship. This is from the mid-50s. Somebody back east built this, and I got this on eBay. I had to bid quite high to get it, because I had to have it in the museum. But this is a 2-meter AM transceiver, uh, less the power supply, built inside a very thin box. And incredible craftsmanship and design on that. Um, Here's an item that everyone really needs for their ham shack. This has a uh, voltmeter to monitor your batter voltage uh, thermometer so you know how hot it is in the shack, and a, uh, a uh, watt meter to show, of course that's a kid with watt meter, but it's still better than on top of there. But it's a nice thing to set on top of the radio so you can know everything you want to know. Now this is my real pride and joy here. This is a DDM. This how many, how many units in here have a 25-year burn-in? This thing has been running constantly for since about 1980 when it was built. And there is still no item on the market that can compare to this thing. You cannot buy a thermometer that reads out to a hundredth of a degree. So I built one. Now why you need to know the temperature to a hundredth of a degree, I don't know. But... Uh, <laughs> Just, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's so sensitive that you can see the temperature change as you walk towards it. Just your radiant body heat causes it to change. So that's a wide variety of uh, homebrew projects here. And please come on up afterwards and take a look at it all. And now, Harry. Good evening, everyone. I'm Harry, W6YO, formerly WA6YO, before that WN6YO, and before that, are you ready for this? Zulu Papa 5 Hotel Zulu. That was my first call. Anybody tell me what country it's from? Saraway, you're right. And so I started off in the DX business as being the DX station, and that's a real thrill when you turn the radio on, ask who's there, and the deluge. I used to talk to my daughters who were in college at the time, and as soon as I got through with them, they, they'd go to the radio club there at the Cal Poly, and when I'd finish with them, everybody and his brother from New York to San Diego would call me because there was only two DX stations in all of Paraguay at the time. A lot of Paraguayan amateurs, but they just talked amongst themselves around town. Anyway, talking about DX, uh, worked all states, and uh, IOTA. First of all, the equipment you need to work DX. What's DX? You need What's a radio. DX? What's DX? We'll tell you that in a moment here. You need a radio, <laughs> you need an antenna, you need a microphone, or a key. DX means distance, but it means a different thing to different people. For the dyed in the wool HFDX, it means talking to the other end of the world. I've got a QSL card here. Uh, you can come up and examine later, uh, that uh, is my last one of all the DXCC entities, 335, that's it. Andaman Islands, uh, made oh, famous when the DX team that was over there switched from DXing to emergency communications. I had a, a chance to meet the lady who was in charge of the group last year, a wonderful lady. That's HF. VHF. It might be uh, the next grid square over, or two grid squares over, if you get uh, e, -sk e skip, uh, it might be halfway across the country. 
six meters, it's a little bit more difficult to work 100 countries than it is on HF. How many awards are there worldwide? Oh, 3,000 some odd. How many countries provide them? Oh, 125 or so. But the principal awards are provided by two groups. One is the ARRL, the American Radio Relay League that Pat talked about earlier. And their big awards are DXCC, that's working 100 DXCC entities, used to be called countries. There are 335 of them, there's a whole flock of them that have been deleted over time, as Czechoslovakia at one time was one country, now it's two. East Germany and West Germany were two countries, now they're one. So over time it changes, but there's 335 current ones. Some of them, we used to call them countries, and people say, but Hawaii is not a country. Yeah, but it's 2,000 miles away. Well, Alaska is not a country. Well, no, not really, but there's another country in between called Canada. So there's 335. So that's something you can start off with when you get your HF uh, license. The other thing is worked all states. How many states do you, are there to work all states? There's 50. And when you work all 50 of them, you've got two DX countries. Actually, three. The United States, Continental, Alaska, and, uh, and Hawaii. One, and, you know, Puerto Rico doesn't count as a state. It's a, it's a territory, but that counts as a DX country. And by, when you're working all states, you're bound to get uh, Puerto Rico along with it. The other uh, group in the world that uh, supports a DX type award of some uh, consequence is the Royal Society of Great Radio Society of Great Britain, Islands on the Air. Now they've taken the world. They've taken all the islands, they've drawn circles around individual islands if they're far enough away, enough away from all the rest, or around island groups, and narrowed it down to be 1,200 island groups in the world. Catalina, San Clemente, and another one are grouped together in North America, 66. All the Hawaiian islands, uh, with the exception of uh, uh, Frenchman Shoals, uh, is, uh, is Oceana 19. Now, once you work 100 countries, you get a DXCC certificate. Once you work uh, within 10 of having them all, you get uh, honor roll. And when you get all 335 of them, and if I could get the, the paperwork on the 334, I'd be top of the honor roll. That's what we all shoot for. On I IOTA, they give you a certificate for each 100 islands work. When you get up to 750 islands, you can get the plaque of excellence. When you get a thousand islands, you get a trophy that looks like you won the Super Bowl. Seriously. <laughs> I have seven, as of yesterday, when the, when the QSL cards came back from the checkpoint, I have 734 islands confirmed. Now, what you have to do is confirm all of these things with a QSL card. All of you have an idea what a QSL card looks like. But I'd like you to come up and take a look at the ones I have for DXCC, for five-band worked all states for IOTA. You can look at the awards directory, and I have a little handout here for each and every one of you, the sources of DXCC information. If you want to learn how to operate DX uh, and not make an idiot of yourself, this is the Bible. If you have a question about operating DX and you can't find the answer in this book, Go back and look again, because it's there. In AC6V, Rod, who runs one of the finest uh, URLs in the world, is the publisher of this book. So come by and look at the cards, books on DXCC, books on 160 DXing, and so on. I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. But if you get into DXing, there's one thing you have to do. I insist upon it, to save yourself. Let's hire a good divorce attorney and put him on retainer. Thank you, Eric. Okay, let's see here if I can. Okay, I was asked to talk on amateur television, microwaves, and satellites tonight. My call is KC6UQH. Is Art. Hey, Art. And been around here in the Vista area in Escondido for several years. Amateur television uses a standard NTSC format, which is the old color television set format that RCA got through the FCC in 1953, or FM, 
MTSC signals that are used like on the C-band satellite signals, uh, systems, which are the older ones with the six foot dishes. Signals on ATV, uh, the AM VSB signals, like your regular television set receives, cover 6 megahertz bandwidth, on FM 27 megahertz. This is compared to 0.016 megahertz for a 2 meter FM radio. In order to have a quality picture, a 200 microvolt signal is needed for your standard television signals and 20 microvolts for FM. This is uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 times more power than is needed for 2 meter FM voice signal. We require high gain directional antennas, short distances, and the power of up to 100 watts in order to get decent pictures. Uh, you can't really have anything interfering in between. ATV is nice because you can see what you're doing at the same time you're talking. Uh, I routinely work uh, repeaters in the Santiago Peak area about 40 miles away from my home in Vista. ATV with its wide bandwidth puts it in the UHF and SHF amateur bands on uh, the typical frequencies that are used are 420 to 440 megahertz, 905 to 925, 1240 to 1277, 2410 to 2450, 3365 to 3495, 5700 to 5925, and 10385 to 10415, and I'm active on 10400 at home. If you're interested, equipment can be purchased from the following companies. PC Electronics, Down East Microwave, 4 atvcom uh, Surplus equipment can be modified. Sources of that would be eBay, swap meets, UC band equipment, VSAC converters, used dish antennas, Wi-Fi amplifiers, and the Radio Shack Wavecom Junior uh, television units. In the microwave activities, the region considered the region for microwaves is considered to be 1240 megahertz and up, which is the 23 centimeter band. And this includes infrared and light, and there are people actually working on laser communications. Unlike the lower frequencies, the only noise from the only noise from the ground and electronic noise from amplifiers limit the receiver performance. The lowest microwave bands offer the best signal noise ratio at 1240 megahertz. The noise from space is decreased to almost zero, maybe 10 or 20 degrees Kelvin, and the signal losses from the bottom of the lowest band all the way up increase about 6 dB every time you double frequency. So it takes four times the power if you double your frequency. So the bottom of the microwave band region is the best uh, for long distance work. The microwave frequency, short wavelengths make parabolic dishes desirable with amazing antenna gains. At 3 centimeters, 10 gigahertz, a 3 foot dish has 36 dB gain, giving a 1 watt transmitter 4,000 watts of effective radiated power. But it's only a degree and a half light. <laughs> so you've got to be very careful how you point it. Microwave dust duct, just like 2 meter VHF, contacts using ducting to Hawaii from California have been made on all bands through 5.76 gigahertz ducts can be caused by temperature inversion or by a layer of trapped it, moist air in the troposphere. Or, in the case of Hawaii contacts, both. Starts out as a duct, and a temperature inversion duct over here moves up into a cold moisture duct and winds up at about 7,000 feet in Oahu, where there are several amateur repeaters, and uh, it's been worked. As the frequency goes up, moisture and oxygen become absorbers in microwaves. At 10 the gigahertz band, the transition point where water can both absorb and reflect waves. Contacts of over 7,000 kilometers have been made on reflections from thunderclouds on 10 gigahertz, which is kind of magical because that's the area where you get both absorbance and reflectance. And believe me, if you've never heard a sideband signal on a bounce off thundercloud, you've never heard something that sounds so weird. And I've never heard anything like it on HF or any other band. In addition, there exists an evaporative layer of moisture at 15 feet above the ocean. During calm period to the sea, distance over 1,000 miles have been worked on this band using a combination of evaporative and temperature inversion ducts. 
Modes worked on microwave include CW, digital mode, single sideband, FM, slow scan, fast scan, video. Contacts range from rain bounce to earth, moon, earth. EME contacts have been made on all bands through 24 gigahertz. By using high gain antenna signals can be bounced off of hills, mountains, buildings, water tanks, anything else that will reflect a signal. Sometimes a double or triple bounce can be worked. The San Diego Microwave Group meets the third Monday of each month. Net on other a net on other part Monday nights at 9 p.m. on our 146.73 repeater. To give you an idea of some of the records, 1296, 4,150 kilometers, 2304, 3,982, also on 3456 and 5760. On 10 gigahertz, 10,368, 1,282 kilometers, 24 gigs, 543 kilometers, 47 gigs is 290 kilometers, 75 gigs 177, and like 248 kilometers. So the idea that you're going to go around the block and talk to the neighbor down the street is not necessarily so. We get into satellites. There are two main types. A LEO for a low earth orbiter. These are satellites under 800 miles or so. And ATO for high earth orbiters, which would go up as high as 60,000 kilometers. Communications distance on LEOs is up to about 3,000 miles. HEO contacts can range up to one half of the Earth in distance. LEOs make about 12 to 14 orbits around the Earth each day and are in view for about 10 to 18 minutes on each pass. HEO satellites make one to two orbits per day and stay in view for many hours. Frequencies are used Amateur bands range from 21 megahertz to 24 gigahertz. Satellites traditionally use digital or single sideband modes for communications. Two meters and 70 centimeters are the most popular bands. Most of the digital satellites have store forward memory to send digital messages around the world. Recently, several FM voice satellites have been launched. FM satellites can be worked with simple antennas and a dual band two meter, 70 centimeter handheld. This is done quite a bit with a small antenna that you point at the satellite. Satellite stations can use simple antennas for moderate performances. Performance on most satellites, high performance antennas require rotors for both azimuth as well as ABA elevation. Tracking satellites is done with a computer program and capture LN elements. Orbital data that needs to be updated every week. Satellite track Tracking programs can be downloaded from the web or purchased from AMSAT North America. Beginners can use the website data that will predict passes if you know your latitude and longitude. You need to check the operational status of the satellites if you want to, that you want to work. Transmit frequencies and times change with power budgets. Some change the bands and modes they operate every week. And a little bit of appendix for ATV. I have www.qsl.net. At ATM, I'll, I'll leave these out here if anybody wants to copy them down. There's one for microwave, one for satellites, and then for in-depth depth study, the gentleman over here, AC6V, has probably the most comprehensive index on his website of anyone I know. Now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Let's see, can everybody in the room hear me? Can you hear me now? Hey, <laughs> Uh, my name is Rod, AC6B, and we hams all adopt a um, kind of a suedo nim, so we get on um, either HF or repeaters, people can understand what our names are. So if your name is Bob, you automatically become Broken Old Bob, and uh, I am known as the Ragged Old Bob. Uh, they asked me to talk on um, the data modes. Uh, and probably at least 15 data modes, and they're growing every day. I uh, just ran across a, a new one, and I didn't have time to look too far into it, but if we go back in time, probably the first digital mode was the Morse code. <laughs> Some debate whether it really is a digital mode, but I think it qualifies. Uh, the next digital mode that came along was RPTY. And this was a version of Frequency Shift King, and it has been used for many, many years. It was used during World War II before 
And some of the machinery was just astounding. We had uh, somebody present RTTY equipment. What's RTTY? Uh, radio type, teletype. Uh, radio teletype, right. And it uses frequency shift key. So it goes here, that's a one, it goes over there, and that's a zero type of thing. And some of the equipment involved was huge consoles. There's a huge typewriter on a stand uh, to send keyboard stuff. And there was a computer rack maybe six foot high to handle all the digital stuff. That goes way back. With the advent of uh, desktop computers and ham radio that could accept digital signals, it's just exploded. I think one of the very popular, maybe about 10 years ago, was packet. Packet radio, and people were getting on VHF and sending packet to a node, which then in turn would be sent by a backbone on a different frequency all across the country and around the world, as a matter of fact. So on packet radio, you could uh, send messages from your location. You had a unique address, and you could send it uh, all across the country, any place in the world. Uh, with the advent of the internet and uh, being able to send email, that has somewhat died down. Packet is used somewhat for DX reporting. Some people still use it. And let's see, the packet um, uh, node on Palomar is still in operation. So that's a, a one of the digital modes you may want to explore. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Probably the most recent development that has the largest popularity is PSK31. And we could send data in a variety of ways. We could shift the frequency for a one or zero. Uh, we could do it by amplitude modulation if we so chose. We can do it by uh, FM if we so choose. But PSK is phase shift king. And one of the modes is um, BPSK. And the B is binary, or, or I should say bi. What it is, we have a reference as far as phase, 0 through 360 degrees. And if we send a signal in directly in phase with that reference, it's a 1 or arbitrarily a 0. Now, if we send another one 180 degrees away, that's the opposite, a 1 or a 0. It doesn't make any difference because at the receiving end, we can invert. So if stuff comes across the wrong way, we can invert. The 31 is one of the surprises. It's 31 hertz. Imagine now setting data. I'm only occupying a 31 hertz bandwidth. That's one of the magic features of it. Another magic feature of it is because it is so narrow bandwidth, your signal to noise ratio becomes very um, amenable to getting signals way down in the noise. We saw a demonstration once where there was a PSK31 signal it was right at the noise level. I mean, it, it was almost like you didn't know it was there. And of course, the screen comes all this information. Uh, let me go back just a bit to other data modes. Some of the data modes are self-correcting. For example, in uh, packet, you send out a signal, it goes to the receiving station, and there's various checksums in the signal. The receiving end looks at it, and if they all add up right, says, OK, I got it. If it doesn't, it comes back to the transmitter and says, do it again. And you do it again until it gets it right. Uh, PSK31 is not error corrected. There is a new version based on, uh, let's see, <laughs> QPSK. And that's a quad system where you've got four of them now. you got zero degrees, 90, 180, 270, and around again. And uh, one, of the, one of those apparently does do some error correcting. So you could be sitting on PSK31, and uh, it's going along fine. The band goes out, somebody else comes over the top of the station you were listening at, and it just becomes garbage. So you have to go back to the guy and say, take this part of it. Well, uh, it's real exciting because it combines computer technology with the radios. The radios nowadays have uh, an RS-232 port on the back. It's got the chips and the, all the digital uh, gadgets in there to accept signals from your computer. Actually, it's all done through the sound card. You type it, the sound card interprets it, sends it out to ports over to your radio, and your radio does 
the phase shifting necessary to serve your signal out. On the other, and then there's software. The software part of it encodes it, and on the other hand, it decodes it. Uh, I think some people get a little reticent about uh, data and typing on a computer and sending because they can't type. Neither can I. <laughs> I'm supposed to be a writer. Uh, it's fairly slow. The throughput, most, most people can type up around 20 or 30 words a minute. That's about the throughput of uh, PSK 31, so don't let that set you back. But even further than that, all the AMQSOs take a format. The format is, name here is QTH, my home uh, is, my equipment is. So you type that ahead, put it into a memory, in a macro, and your first contact, you, you hear the station comes through, you get the call sign, it's K3PXX, you type that in the computer, it goes into the macros. Now when you push the button to transmit, it picks that information up and says K3PXX, DE, it says AC6 feet, all automatic. Then when it comes to the brag tape, that is who you are, where you came from, and all that kind of thing, you push another button that's called the brag tape button. It just spits out paragraph after paragraph, if you wish, about all this stuff, because it's the same thing over and over again. Now, once that is through, then you're going to get into conversation with somebody and you're going to have to do some typing. But while you're reading his message, you can type it into a buffer, and even hot and poke, you can usually keep up with them. And uh, it becomes time to do it. So it's a real fun mode. The, the, the message comes right across your screen with uh, fairly strong signals. Uh, it's very, very, uh, very reliable. But it can pick them out of the noise very nicely, too. What does it take to get into it? It's very cheap. If you have a computer close to your uh, AM rig, all you have to do is interface from the output of your computer, RS-232 typically, into the RS-232 port of your radio. Most modern radios have that. That controls the innards of the radio, tells it when to transmit, and uh, uh, when to receive, and uh, the functions you need. Then there's a sound card output, and the sound card input, and that's basically it. Some people have constructed a gist of wiring and a couple of diodes. You really do need isolation, so you can get away with that if you're careful if you put in some attenuation. But there are some kits out, and one of the uh, favorite kits, one I bought, because uh, I was in a big hurry to get it ready for field day, is the Rascal kit. It's made by Buxcom. I have all this information here. And the uh, Rascal kit is about this big. It's not in a very nice box but it is very inexpensive. Easy to build, or they'll have it uh, pre-made for you. And it's designed for all the different radios. I don't care what you got. If you got a Linko, you got a Drake, Kenwood, what you have, he has kits for it. And I have a diagram here of how it hooks up. It's just typically the RS-232 connection to the Rascal kit, back again, and then the line in, line out. So give it a try, it, uh, it is a lot of fun. Is it break time? It is break time. Okay, thank you. Stunning for the Okay, in the back of the room is a handout sheet as to what you're going to get into when you get on to uh, two weeks. And generally, when you get your license, that's the first place you go. Uh, to tell you about the repeater, how it operates, uh, all about the timer, what the beep is, how to get into conversations, and so if the repeaters be puzzle you into some degree, they do be puzzle me actually all the time. There's a handout sheet in the back of that uh, you might want to take a look at. Ready? Do I have to get my name all over again? I'm Rod Dickens, uh, AC6 feet, and this is my favorite topic, six meters. Okay, what I did uh, about six meters was I needed a backup rate for my huge, huge Kenwood that I could carry around and take the field day, take up north and operate from up there. So I bought a second rig, and uh, much to my delight, it had six meters into it. So what I did with uh, the radio is I uh, put up a quarter wave antenna, which is only about five foot high, and five foot radios, roughly. Jumped on the air, and went to get on the local repeater, the part six meter repeater. 
I'm sure I had the PO right, I'm sure I was on the right frequency, and I tried and tried it for nothing. So I listened all over the band, and I didn't hear a thing. So I called my neighbor and I said, good grief, I, was, I did something wrong. Could you check me out here? It's only a mile down the road. He says, yeah, about 10 minutes, come back. And give me 10 minutes and I'll, I'll meet you on 50.125. I said, okay. So on 51.25, I tuned in. And there's a station there calling CQ from the state of Hawaii. Now, on six meters, that is a long haul. I didn't think too much about it, put it in the long book, and I said, well, that works. So I got to asking around, and I found out the park repeater was down. That's why I couldn't even get to the park repeater. And I didn't have enough information to get on to any others. So there I was, I worked Hawaii, and it turns out Hawaii is one of the toughest states to work on six meters. The other one is Alaska. That's another long haul. Let's look at six meters, and what is six meters? Well, to begin with, it's uh, 50 to 54 megahertz. And HF is 3 to 30. And VHF is 30 to 300. And then 300 uh, whatever is UHF. So the 6 meter band is a UHF band. Are you going to talk to Alaska or Hawaii on 2 meters? Yeah, I'm using Art's method, which is ducking. It's VHF. But, uh, VHF. What? Six meters is VHF. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> it's uh, 30 to 300 is VHF. Therefore, six meters is a uh, VHF band. But it has some very uh, similarities to the HF band, particularly 10 meters. But what would you think if you tuned in your television station on channel 2 with an outdoor antenna before all this cable stuff? And you saw a station coming in from New York. Six meters long. <laughs> it, it is entirely possible. Years ago, I was watching Cleveland, Ohio station, a French station. All of a sudden, all the bars started to go everywhere. And another signal came in, totally took over the channel, and it was down in Texas, as I recall, San Antonio. I didn't know what was going on in those days. wasn't going on. OK, there are about, uh, let's see, 12 propagation modes in six meters. Many of them are very esoteric, and they are, there's things like rate scatter. There's uh, others like meteor scatter. And to go back to data for a moment, and the data boys have worked up a very, very high speed data program, which bounces off the meteor trails and comes back, and then you can decipher it because the trails are very slow. Another way of doing that is setting up high speed CW to come down high speed CW and record it and play it back slow. But uh, the main modes for uh, six meters is one, just like the HF bands, it's an F2 layer. And the higher you go in frequency, the higher the skip distance, the longer the skip distances get. When you're on F2 layer for six meters, you'll skip out about all the way across the country with nothing in between. You work the whole eastern seaboard, the Caribbean, down to Central South America, very, very long angle, long range skip. So when would six meters uh, experience that flare skip? Now, well, your sunspots are way down. But the only time you're going to get that flare skip on six meters is when the solar cycle is up and it's towards its peak, and the SFI is somewhere up in the high 200s. Then it is entirely possible and it's very exciting. But it doesn't last long. Back. Well, in the meantime, you can listen to six meter band and not hear anything. A couple of repeaters, a couple of loads, that's about it. Yeah. But at certain times of the year, another phenomenon came, comes along. It's called sporadic E. We have F layers and E layers and D layers. Now, the sporadic E is one of those phenomena that the scientists can't quite figure out. Nobody's quite sure what causes it. Some uh, think it has to do with uh, wind shear. Some think it has to do with uh, uh, weather, thunder, and so on. It certainly has nothing to do with the solar cycle. So when sporadic heat occurs, you will routinely, at certain times of the year, in the summer, during the day, work six meters with very low power, minimum antenna, all over the west. You'll have a pipeline into Washington, Oregon, 
uh, downtown Denver, uh, perhaps almost out to the Mississippi. So you say, well, how in the world do I get to work all states? On occasion, there's another cloud out there. So you go up to the western cloud, so to speak, bounce off the ground, back up, and you get another strategy cloud. Now you're in the West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, and all over the place. Not easy to do to work all states, but it is practical. What do you need? You need a side band. An FM radio just, I have worked some FM skin, but not very much. You need a side band radio. And uh, 25 watts to do the trick, 100 watts, fine. And a uh, five foot quarter wave antenna, better still a five eighths wave antenna, and you can work all of that. In addition, at times you'll be working in uh, Japan, the Pacific Islands, and very, very seldom on this west coast you'll be working into Europe, because that's very rare. The east coast works into Europe all the time, makes you sick. All right, I have a handout sheet here that tells you about the propagation, and tells you how to work six meters, and uh, how to set up your radio for uh, results, and where to find the information. My call is WD6FWE, my name is Don, and we're going to be talking about mobile operation. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to, to really get on mobile. A lot of people seem to feel that uh, you got to punch big holes in your car and, uh, and spend a lot of money, but you really don't have to. Now, uh, there are people that do, uh, like Kerry back there. I think he has, uh, what is it, 11 radios in your car? Only nine. Oh, only nine? But he can work every band from 160 through uh, uh, 1296 in his car. Uh, myself, I just have an ICOM 706. So I'm limited to going up to 450. Uh, I can use uh, uh, up to 100 watts, uh, depending upon the band, uh, all, all modes. Uh, I work on 6 meters quite a bit with Rod. And uh, I have actually uh, successfully worked uh, PSK31 in my car uh, with no hardware. Uh, just uh, using the microphone built into my uh, computer and uh, the speaker in, in the computer talking to the microphone, it, uh, I have one successful contact that way just to prove a point. You don't have to go and use hardware to hook things up. But uh, to work successfully in, in the car, you need to have the proper equipment. You, you do need to be able to tune your antenna. But this is an MFJ uh, uh, 259, which uh, really helps uh, tune the antennas uh, very, very nicely. Uh, it'll work on any band from uh, 160 up through the 2 meter band. They have another version that will actually work on the 450 band. But th this, th this will tune your antenna without putting out any interfering signals. Uh, unless, of course, uh, you consider the fact that it is actually a QRP transmitter and it can be heard on some bands. Uh, I've never heard of anybody uh, deliberately doing it, but I suspect you can probably hear it a couple hundred miles away on, on some of the bands. Uh, I usually use a millimeter magnet mount antenna, which uh, is a rather big magnet. Uh, you, 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 you couldn't hang onto a building with it uh, and, and hang on the building, but it'll keep it on your car. There aren't. A, was somebody asking a question? What band is that? Uh, right now, it's on a 10 meter band. Uh, the width. Is it was actually uh, is the antenna that I've been using for the longest amount of time. And by the way, it comes off the magnet uh, uh, very easily, and I can change it to another band uh, just by uh, grabbing another antenna and putting it on the mount. Ten seconds between between bands. That's even faster than a screwdriver. Of course, you've got to be stopped to do it. <laughs> uh, the screwdriver antenna. This this particular one belongs to Lord, and uh, it will tune any band from uh, 160 through 6 meters. He has two tops on it. If you look at it carefully, uh, this one is the short top. This one works 6 meters. If he wants to go on 160 and tune the entire band, he has to put a, a longer whip on it, probably the size of this 11-meter uh, uh, whip that I was using, which I use on 10 meters. I've been using uh, the, the one antenna here that I showed earlier. It's actually an 11-meter antenna. It just happens to tune better on 10 meters than it does on 11, and I've been using this one since 1972. They, they last a long time, is when you don't break them. But, uh, I have been uh, collecting other antennas that I have found. Uh, this antenna is, uh, I'm not certain what band it's for because I haven't been able to tune it. It's, it's one that I've been uh, playing with for a while. I, I do have a 20 meter antenna here. Uh, it's a two section antenna. I have to take, put the tip on it. Uh, screw it onto the top, 
And then it, it uh, hooks onto the magnet mount, the same as all the other ones, with a quick disconnect. Uh, when you're working mobile, you need to have uh, other test equipment to verify the transmission line. So I have a, 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 a dummy load which uh, plugs onto the end of my transmission line when I want to check to make certain my transmission line is, uh, is working, uh, whenever, it, as occasionally happens, that uh, something isn't working. Now, I also have a homebrew antenna. This is a piece of PVC pipe with uh, about uh, 120 feet of uh, number 18 copper wire wrapped around it and black tape to hold it so it doesn't slap around too much. Uh, when I take my 11 meter whip and put it on top of this, I'm working on 160 meters mobile. And it works actually quite well. I have uh, I've worked in Canada uh, a few times, uh, Oregon and Washington. Uh, there are a lot of little things that uh, help. For example, you know, you think of these as a paper clip. Believe it or not, uh, th th this is also very handy in mobile when you need to clamp a wire onto something. Uh, you can, if you need a ground clamp, real quick, you just reach in there and grab something, you have your wire attached to it, and you clip it to things. The mobiles uh, come in all sizes. I mentioned earlier that I have uh, an ICOM 706, and uh, I also, um, you know, you don't have to have something expensive. You can go out there and pick up a uh, inexpensive uh, used, no, wrong, wrong way. An inexpensive uh, used radio, which is, um, this in here is, a, is actually uh, belongs to uh, Dennis. Uh, he uses it, loans it to uh, New Hams. And uh, it puts, it's a dual, dual band radio uh, on uh, 2 meters and 440. It puts out 25 watts on 2 meters and 10 watts on 440. Um, if you want higher power, well, you go out and uh, get an amplifier. This is a 440 amplifier, which uh, puts out about 100 watts uh, when it's driven with enough power. I believe it takes probably 25 watts to drive it up to 100 watts. I'm not absolutely certain. And uh, one of the things always that come in handy when you're running mobile, carry a spare uh, power cord, because uh, this, when accidents happen, your power cords, uh, they're the first thing to break. You know, maybe if something happened to your battery, uh, it's corroded, and, uh, well, you always hook up directly to the battery anyway if you're smart, and that's why these things go bad. You can hook directly to the battery, the acid gets on, eats the cable, and all of a sudden you don't have enough length to reach the radio anymore. <laughs> and uh, basically that's it for, for myself. N6FN, and most people call me Bernie, I'm an entrepreneur of my name, and uh, I've been asked to talk to you about uh, programming radios. Uh, that's a pretty broad subject, so we'll zero in on primarily uh, mobiles and HTs. Now, well, speaking of HTs and mobiles, back not too many years ago, uh, programming was pretty simple. You basically went to the catalog and picked a couple of crystals. Anybody remember those radios? <laughs> Yeah, your offset was handled by received crystal and a transmit crystal. There was no tones, there was none of this stuff. So it was real simple. It was pretty awkward though, and it kept the crystal guys in business. Uh, not too long after that, uh, they developed synthesized radios with the development of the phase lock loop and digital circuitry. And then we got a little step better. We now had a thumb wheel on the top of the radio to set the frequency. You could go any frequency you want, but you had to know what the frequency was and move the thumb wheel. And then ICOM and a few other people came out with uh, radios with the diode boards, if some of you remember those, I think. I see 22S. The 21 or 22? 22S. 22 channel synthesized, it looked like a CB rig, and you could set uh, any frequency you wanted to any of the 22 channels by changing the diodes on this diode board. Well. Along came microprocessors and integration. Uh, and Life's the never been the same. Radios, and they, right. It's never been the same since. They went absolutely crazy. Uh, the VX7 now uh, has a mode where uh, it probably has three menus to do with how you want the LED on the front panel to flash, what color, the rate. It's got everything in there to confuse the innocent, more or less. Uh, but besides that, there are a lot of useful features. There's scanning. Uh, we can now put lots of channels in memory. Some of the radios um, are being delivered today with up to a thousand uh, uh, memory channels in the radio. So let's go down through that. If you have one of these radios, first off, you've got to figure out uh, where you're going to be using it. For most of us, it's going to be on two meters. 
So you've got two meter only rigs, you've got 440, that's probably a, the next most common. Some of your rigs might have uh, uh, six meters, 50 megahertz, and might also have 220, depending on the radio. So the first step in programming that rig is to get on the air with it, so you're gonna to wanna to put in some simplex channels and some repeater <coughs> channels. So the first step you gotta have, is, and Steve will talk about that, is figure out what frequencies you need where the repeaters are at, what you're likely to be using. Then after that, you need to know a couple other pieces of critical information. What's the offset for that, which is you receive on one frequency, you listen to the repeater, the frequency's coming in, but when you transmit, it's gonna go back out on a different frequency. And depending on the band and which section of the band you're in and how that repeater's set up, sometimes you transmit above or below what you receive. The next piece of crucial information you gotta have is you gotta know the access tone. Now the access tone typically is what they call CTCSS, uh, Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System, I think. Uh, but the manufacturers of the radios have really confused things because not everybody calls it that. Motorola originally planted that process years ago and they called it PL for private line. Um, other manufacturers called it other things. Today, ARL particularly, uh, refers to it as a CTCSS. Kenwood and uh, Yesu typically call it that. Um, ICOM, when you get down to programming your radio, it'll usually say RT and CT, and they've got it split because when you look at CTCSS, there's two modes for that. One is, is you have, if you're gonna use a repeater, you need to transmit a tone so that repeater will kick in and retransmit your signal. The other is, is the squelch part of it. So the same tone can be used to squelch your radio. So the access to repeaters, you, be, you really have to set in the transmit one. Now some of your rigs will uh, allow you to independently set differently the transmit frequency and the receive frequency. I haven't come into an application where that's necessary, but the radios do it, so it's a little bit of confusion when you get down to that step, which one are you setting? Well, if you need to access that repeater, it's the one that's gonna be transmitted that you want. Um, now on the radios, when you get down to that, the nomenclature that they use most often is tone. If you see the T on the LCD, that's your transmit, it's tone. If you get down to the TSQ, that's gonna transmit the tone and also squelch your radio till it receives the same tone back. Now the majority of the repeaters will also transmit the tone back and you ask, what good is that? Well. Uh, a lot of our radios today are general coverage receivers as well. They'll go from way down in the short wave all the way up to you know, 900 megahertz, some of them. Uh, the problem with that is that they're wide open for uh, interference and intermod problems. You get a lot of squealing with these kinds of radios, particularly if you get near some of the hospitals and some of the places, <coughs> get near his truck. <laughs> You're likely to have intermod. Well, if you put your tone squelch on, your radio is going to stay quiet, even though it would otherwise be interfering with. So that's why you'd want to use that. Now, if you're operating simplex, uh, this can be kind of nice. And it's, you often see the same mode on the FRS and the GMRS radios, where they use the CTCSS or the DCS, which is a digital code system, to squelch the radio. So that even though you're on a busy channel, I some of you will probably use the FRS. You're driving around town, it's annoying. There's a lot of people Disneyland. on it. Huh? Disneyland. Disneyland, it's probably the worst place in, in the insane. planet. Right. It's insane. So you can't hardly use the radio. But if you've got one that has that feature, you won't listen to everybody else's traffic. You'll only listen to, what, 120th of it, I guess. However many of those codes they're, they're using on those radios. 30, 30, 30, 30. Whatever. But it's easy to get fooled because even though you don't hear that guy, he's there, he's talking, he's on the frequencies. So you key down and you're right on top of them because you don't know he's there. But it is used. Um, I'm not aware of, of any repeaters that, that, uh, that use the DCS code when we start talking about that. That's a digital coded squelch. So you can see as you get into this, programming your radio all of a sudden gets a little confusing because you need to know the frequency, you need to know the offset, whether it's plus or minus, and you also need to know what the frequency offset is. Uh, on two meters, it's typically 600. Uh, kilohertz, uh, unless it's an odd offset repeater, which could be anything. Odd offset could mean a different frequency, it could also mean that the shift 
is not standardized as well. Fortunately, there are standards. Yeah, most of the time, they're, you're in good shape. But the radios are set up to deal with these scenarios. And when you go down to the instruction manual, you know, they may or may not tell you in that section what you need to do. The other thing you talked about is, is the, the memories. Okay, on your memories, you've got lots of memories today. There are some strategies what to use them for. One of them is to uh, program every repeater pair in so that you put it in scan mode. And you can do this without setting a squelch tone so that you can go up and down the band and just listen to your repeater frequencies as you travel around the country. The other is a trick that I like to do is uh, going from here to Bishop or here to Utah, I've got the repeaters in sequence that I'll be working along the way. So I just reach down the radio, click, 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 kind of like going on an airplane being transmitted, you know, going to different zones. You just move right on down, and then when you come home, you just click, 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 back to you get home. Uh, I have some handouts here, um, enough for everybody. On, a, on generically how you go through and describing some of these uh, the, these issues with the radios. Thank you. Pardon? Uh, mentioned that you'll be here to answer questions. I'll be here to answer questions, but not on specific radios. There's too many of them. Does anyone have a copy of this repeater directory that I took from the TASMA website this morning? If anyone doesn't have it, put your hand up. Bob will come around and give them to you. Keep your hands up. They're by the door behind you, Bob. Okay. Anyways, this one will be quick, folks. Okay, repeater directories. Now, for those of you that are studying for the exam or just had the exam, the question in the technician pool tells you or asks you what information do you need to know to program in a repeater. And the official answer on the test is you need to know the repeater input and the offset. In reality, now that's that's the question on the test, and that's the answer you want to put on the test. In reality, you need to know the repeater output frequency and the offset. Now, this is just a sample of a two-meter uh, repeater directory from the TASMA, that's the local repeater coordinator for Southern California. They give a, a list of repeaters. The, uh, by the way, the paper that's going around that people should have is pretty much their complete list. I've been told there's at least one repeater missing. You folks that are involved in that repeater need to talk to TASMA, not me, because I just took it off their website. Anyways, so we have a frequency. In this case, it's uh, 14688. Uh, that is a year's repeater. It tells you the frequency that the repeater output, that's the one you listen to. Uh, you program your radio to listen to this frequency. The minus offset tells you that whatever the standard offset is going to be a negative. In this case, being two meters, it will be 600 kilohertz down. Most new radios, that is an automatic feature. There's one repeater in San Diego County I'm aware of. And that's the Amateur Radio Club of El Cajon has a repeater that is an odd frequency pair, and that's not on this list, it is on the list that's gone around. And that one will have to be programmed independently. Anyway, so you have the repeater output frequency, the one you listen to, the input frequency that lets you get to the frequency the repeater listens to, who the repeater is. If you notice, we have several. Our call sign is W6NWG. Ours are on Palomar Mountain, hence the Palomar Amateur Radio Club. That's the location where it's going to be, which helps you if you have a directional antenna or trying to figure out what mountains are in the way. would we'll let you know where it's at roughly. Who the sponsor is, in our case, Palomar Amateur Radio Club. Then the CTCSS, or PL tone. This is the subaudible tone you need to program in to uh, be able to access the repeater. Notice our 146, uh, 7, what, 7, 3, and 700. I don't even see our 7, 3 on here. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, got, we got it off one. Yeah. Yeah, it okay. Anyways. Uh, some do not have a PL tone, most do. In the ca case of all these on this particular list, these are open, which means anyone can use it without belonging to the club. In our case, there would also be some other codes here, which you do not see if you look at a repeater directory. C with a CA would be for like a closed auto patch. Uh, so lowercase e would be for emergency power, S, I believe an SUN or whatever is for solar. Anyways, this is the information you need. You just need the repeater output frequency, the offset, who it is, where they are, the name of the sponsor, the PL tone if applicable, and that it's open. There are some closed repeaters. Those are ones where you need to get permission of the repeater owner before you use it. You notice on your list uh, there's several racing repeaters. They are closed. I think there's a few others. I'm not going to go over them tonight. Anyways, that's it on repeater directories. Mark, 
one comment, the one that does not have a tone, that's our 146.7. That's a digital repeater that back it. It doesn't use the tone. Yeah, I wanted to uh, remind everyone that the 147, 146, 700 is a packet repeater, a digital repeater. Do not use voice on that. People will be very, very upset with you. If you have a packet machine, they love to have you on there and get it used more often. Okay, it is time to turn this over. Go ahead and drop that, and I'm going to hand this over to the Red Cross. Okay. I'm Sarah, KG6 to UK, and um, what I'd like to do this evening is just share with you just a little bit about what the Red Cross does and then share how it is that you might become involved in that. Um, and given the, the hour of the evening as well as the audience, I'm going to try to be as short about uh, what the Red Cross does so you get a sliver of the entire pie this evening, um, but not, not a comprehensive overview. Um, uh, essentially, the American Red Cross in San Diego, the local chapter in San Diego, does a lot of disaster response work. Um, our, our teams are called DAT teams, disaster action teams, and there's our teams go out and are assigned a week a month to serve their on-duty time from 6 in the evening until 8 in the morning. And should the pager go off, a team of 4 to 5 people go to wherever it is the disaster is occurring, and that can be anything from a single family fire, your house is burning down and you have no place to go tomorrow, no place to sleep tonight, no clothes because you ran out, no shoes, what do you do with the dog, um, dog food, medicines, I, you left your eyeglasses next to the bed because you usually take them off when you're going to sleep. Those kinds of things the American Red Cross is there for, um, to help you get the next night's sleep, to make sure that you're taken care of in the emergency response. Insurance kicks in, families kick in, but it's essentially the emergency response. That's the basic, most basic level of response that we take care of. Um, beyond the DAT team, we then deal also with more long-term disasters, and some of you will remember the San Diego fires in 2003. Shelters were open, people needed long-term housing, they needed horses taken care of. The American Red Cross does more than just provide food. Very often, we're very much seen as the canteen organization, but we do a lot more than that. Um, we have, Julie, if you can stand up here, I'm, I'm going to ask the volunteers who are currently in the room to just stand up and be recognized because they can answer questions afterwards as much as I can. And I'm only in the organization for just a little bit more than two years. These folks are much longer than I. Julie Murray, um, Karen Dosey, please stand. Bob Birds is up in the back. He's one of your board members. Tony May is here. Who else do we have in the audience? Please stand up if I haven't seen you yet. Thank you, Darlene Early. Steve Early here in the corner with me. Anybody else? But anybody that has ever volunteered for the Red Cross, why don't you stand up real quick? All right. Even supporting, even Aries folks and everyone else who's ever supported the Red All right, Cross. Right, um, Thank you. Essentially, between going out and helping with these single family fires or whatever might occur in the middle of the night on a random night to the long term effects, the Red Cross is there providing a variety of services. Those services can include everything from needing to move this pile of food to that pile of food, making sure that there are enough cots and blankets. So we need a variety of skills, anywhere from laying phone wire to using a forklift to making sure that we can uh, communicate around the local area as well as the country, as Harry W6YOO knows in his rescue efforts in the Katrina hurricanes. Um, and um, thank you. I did that blank, Howard. Thank you, Howard. Um, so essentially, the American Red Cross tries to be there to help people, and here's the catch, to prepare for, to respond to, and to recover from disasters. That's what we do. Um, of course, I shared with you earlier, the pie's a lot larger than what I just shared with you, but uh, given the time. What, how you can become involved. The San Diego chapter of the American Red Cross, your local chapter, has a goal a vision of having San Diego become the most prepared community in the nation. That's a recent goal. We've just established that over the course of the summer. We're now in full force. Today, March 1, begins the beginning of Red Cross Month. So here we are. This is our month to start our awareness in order to achieve that vision. So number one, as a San Diego citizen, you can help us be prepared as you are in your, do you have a kit in your car that will last you for three days? Do you have a kid at home? Do you have a plan? Do you have a second plan? Do you have a third plan? Do your children know it? 
Do your cousins, uncles, aunts, and whomever who don't live in San Diego, do they know it just in case something happens here? Those are the kinds of questions we would ask you as San Diego citizens to make sure that you have. If you can't answer those questions, by all means, contact us, get to the website, do what you need to do to help us help you become more prepared. So there's the basic. The second one would be uh, communications. Uh, Bob Birch is our volunteer, sta volunteer staff. He works really hard. He's been connected with the Red Cross for more than 30 years. Um, he is helping our American Red Cross communications department be as ready as it possibly can be so that every DAT team, when they go out or are on duty, have one person who's a ham radio operator on site, and that could be anywhere from Warner Springs to Chula Vista to El Centro, and we have one ham radio operator who's at home when the pager goes off to say, I'm going to monitor and make sure those people, when they go out, they're safe. We know where they are the entire time that they're out. So Bob is making sure that every one of our DAT teams, we have four North DAT teams, North County, everything, that's 52, North to Camp Pendleton and East from the coast all the way to Arizona, I think. Um, so that covers that space. We don't necessarily from San Diego go all the way over there. There's folks in El Centro that help us cover that space. But essentially, we want to make sure that all of our DAP teams have that, that monitoring as well as the ability to communicate. Um, that's north and then south, obviously, from 52 goes all the way down to the border. So if you're interested at all in being a ready person and going out in the middle of the night, sometimes that's hard to do, but it's well worth it when you have somebody really thank you in the morning uh, for the work that you did with them in the evening. Um, or if you're willing to stay home and just monitor for those three or four hours that somebody else is going out and doing the work and you can't perhaps you can't leave because you have commitments to children or commitments to a family member that you can't leave the house but you are willing to give three or four hours in the evening to stay back and monitor while everybody goes out. So it's a very easy way to be able to help. Um, the next one too is that we have uh, a Red Rose Society which is a fundraising organization with the Red Cross that is, has so far raised $30,000 towards creating a Red Cross communications vehicle specifically for our chapter, which is fantastic. So I believe the plans were ready yesterday or getting ready today, um, and it will soon become an actuality for our chapter and for you all as well as, as San Diego citizens for readiness purposes. Additionally, beyond that, we have nine ECRVs, Emergency Communication Response Vehicles, around the country. And these, all nine of them, I believe, were deployed in Katrina. I just recently saw the, the data fields as to where their coverage was. And it was an impressive line of all the way across the Gulf Coast of these, these nine ECRVs and, and the area that they, they were able to cover with $300,000 each worth of equipment inside of them to be able to connect to satellites as well as other radios as well as the internet. Um, so that's an impressive piece. Which brings me to the point that you can volunteer on a local level, you can also volunteer on a national level, given experience, excuse me, and involvement. Um, the last piece is partnerships. The American Red Cross is a volunteer organization. We're based on people that can do. Um, our volunteer base is much larger than our staff base. Um, for every staff member, there's at least one volunteer and then an entire team of people helping that volunteer achieve each one of the individual missions. So if communications is something that you love to do, Bob is the man to speak to or any one of us here in the room because each one of us here, obviously, we have our ham radio licenses and we're looking towards generals and helping out in developing our own skills and being very much a novice that needs to develop quickly. But in the, in the case of a real emergency, we do need to depend on people who are very skilled and further experience than necessarily we are. So your help is, is very much needed as, as you can offer. Um, did I forget anything, anything else that we should contribute? Okay, uh, thank you very, oh, one more thing. I'm, I'm switching hats just a little bit. Um, some of you know, some of you don't know, I am I'm a graduate of Yale University and I'm currently the president of Yale Club of San Diego. And to help celebrate uh, Red Cross Month, the Yale Club of San Diego is hosting a benefit concert on March 15th at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego in La Jolla. The tickets are $20. If you can come and attend, that would be fantastic. Um, it all goes to a good cause to help San Diego become the most prepared community. On top of that, uh, there are three Yale a cappella singing groups 
If you enjoy people singing, there's no musical accompaniment. It's just voice. It's just sound. It's absolutely wonderful. So if you have the evening free, if you have the time, if you have the 20 bucks in your wallet that you're willing to share, please join us. Thank you very much. I'm David, KC6YSO, and I'm not at all sure what Dennis was thinking of when he assigned me this topic. It's how to join a normal conversation. <laughs> there's, there's two problems with that. One is a, a question of etiquette, and I'm not sure that I'm an expert on etiquette. <laughs> and the other is, if you listen to the repeaters, when was the last time you heard a normal conversation? <laughs> Seventy-five meters. <laughs> now I'm just talking about repeaters. Seventy-five meters is a whole different issue. Uh, seriously, though, each repeater has its own bit of etiquette about how you uh, uh, operate on the um, repeater. And the best way to learn how any given repeater operates is just to listen to it for a while, uh, see what people do, and uh, hope that the people that you're listening to are some of the better operators instead of some of those other folks. <laughs> the uh, Malabar repeaters enjoy a reputation of being some of the friendliest repeaters anywhere in Southern California, and I think we should all be very proud of that uh, fact. Most of the people on these repeaters are uh, very friendly, very forgiving, and if you do something uh, uh, dumb, you'll probably hear about it, but you'll hear about it with a, a, a smile. If, you, if the repeater is dead and you just want to talk to somebody, the usual procedure is just to identify yourself. Throw out your call sign. KC6YSO monitoring. Or KC6YSO mobile. And maybe you'll jar somebody out of a reverie that will uh, answer you. Maybe you won't, and if that happens, well, you've just got silence for a while. There's not much you can do about it. If there's a conversation going on and you... Uh, uh, want to uh, join it, the same procedure generally works, or some people just use the uh, suffix of their call signs. Uh, from an etiquette point of view, using the suffix is reasonably okay. From an FCC point of view, you haven't identified yet, so if you just throw your suffix out sometime within the next 10 minutes, you're going to have to identify to keep from uh, being in a violation. And if you just want to get into a round table, that, that generally works. Sometimes you'll hear somebody um, asking a, a, a question, traffic report, uh, driving directions, uh, goodness knows what have you. And um, if nobody else seems to know the answer, and you do, but make sure you do know the answer, the um, procedure that's frequently used is just to say info. And usually uh, whoever is next in the rotation will say go ahead info, and then you can throw in whatever information you've got, which is hopefully uh, uh, some benefit. Sometimes people say comment. Comment is usually just for what it sounds like comment, which is not necessarily adding information to it, but it's, it's another way to get in. So all of these schemes generally work on these re on the Palomar repeater without getting you um, kind of seriously yelled at. Now all you new folks are going to have all kinds of questions, at least I hope you will. The uh, license exam is, doesn't cover everything by any means. That, uh, like a cartoon I saw at the DMV one time, and the lady says, gee, I wish it was as easy to drive as it was to get my license. So <laughs> ham radio is somewhat the same way. <laughs> Palomar Club uh, sponsors a net called the Ham Help Net which meets each Thursday evening at 9 o'clock on the 146.73 machine. And this is a place you can go to ask almost any kind of question you might imagine about operating procedures, equipment, uh, computers, antennas, batteries, uh, you name it, we probably dealt with it at one time or another. And Pref it's a good place to get it. Hmm? Preferably radio-based, though. Yeah, prefer preferably radio-based, but occasionally we uh, get off, off in the weeds, but that's all right, too. <laughs> um, it's a good, a good place to go to get into a uh, uh, discussion. 
The net has been lagging somewhat, but now that I've got a whole bunch of new hams to talk to, maybe we can uh, uh, stir it up a little bit. So I'd like to see you on the net it's Thursday night, 9 o'clock, 173 machine. Yes? Say again the net frequency. 146.73 minus 600 offset, and I think the uh, no PL. I think the book says uh, a 107.2 PL, but normally the PL is turned off on that uh, repeater, so uh, you don't need one. You don't, or you can even have a wrong one, and it'll still work. Uh, who's next? Sir. I'm Mike, N6GEM, and I'm here tonight to give you some information on how hams are, uh, we're beginning to use them in uh, CERT San Diego, CERT being a community emergency response team. Uh, real briefly, uh, CERT San Diego got started shortly after the Cedar fires. Uh, it was pretty quickly recognized that uh, that was a resource that was needed within the communities. And that's where Search San Diego got its beginnings. We're trying to get uh, AMS established within Search San Diego, within the different community teams, to provide communication support for those community teams. Uh, to communicate within each team, and then to be able to communicate among the teams, and then be able to communicate with uh, San Diego Fire EOC. Uh, CERT will go into, come into play when there's a major event that uh, overwhelms the first responders. We're part of and are a volunteer service under San Diego Fire and Rescue, so we're there also to support them if the need arises. We have nine community teams within San Diego City Within those teams, we have currently 15 uh, CERT Academy grads that are amateur radio operators uh, within six of those teams. The current academy, which is scheduled to graduate on the 18th, uh, we've got 12 that are already amateur radio operators and have their license. And tomorrow night, uh, there will be 11 testing. They've been attending a, a special class that was set up for the CERT members within the CERT Academy that wanted to get their ham lines. So hopefully we'll have 11 more hams to uh, add to CERT San Diego. If anybody here is from the city and is interested in CERT, I have the application forms and the CERT Academy information. If you from other communities in the county, I have a listing of the contact points for the CERT managers for the various areas within the county, if you're interested. And I think that covers everything I wanted to talk about. Well, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is I'm the last presenter. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> the bad news is I have two subjects. <laughs> uh, my name's Gary Kent. My call sign is W6GDK. And I'm going to talk about two things, making an emergency communications. I'm going to deal with uh, basically a repeater since that's what most of us will face uh, in our ham radio careers. The second subject will be uh, what to do if there's an emergency. So let's say you're driving down, uh, you're on your way home tonight, you're going down Palomar Airport Road, and Steve Early passes you like a crazy man and loses control and goes off into the ditch. What are you going to do after you stop laughing? <laughs> well, you're going to pull out your cell phone, and hopefully it's on, and you're going to dial 911 and you're gonna to talk directly to the dispatcher for 911. The reason we say use your cell phone, if there's cell phone service around, it's the most direct and quickest way to get help for the victim in that car. Now let's say you're driving down Scripps Poway Parkway in the People's Republic of Poway. And for those of you that don't know Poway, 
Verizon has pulled out all of their cell sites in Poway because the city council has made it so difficult to put up antennas. So there are frequent areas in Poway with no cell service. So Steve passes you again, got his car fixed, <laughs> and he goes off the road. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to pick up your handheld walkie-talkie or maybe your mobile, and you're going to go to a repeater, hopefully, that you know is reasonably busy. Let's say 14673. There's always somebody there. Uh, Rod or, or Art are, are frequently on there and can give you assistance. There's a lot of other people. If, there, if nobody is on the repeater, you're going to say something like, this is W6GDK with emergency traffic. Is there anybody that can give me assistance? And hopefully somebody will come up and say, yes, I can help you. What do you need? Now, when you relay them the information, you want to be calm. This, this is the hard part. Believe it or not, it is really hard to sit there and be calm. So you want to stop, take a few deep breaths, count to ten, stop laughing, count to ten again. <laughs> and give them the location where you're at. Um, if there are injuries, if you determine that, if you haven't determined that yet, then you may want to get out and ascertain whether there's injuries. You need to let people know what's going to be required as far as emergency services. Do they need to send an ambulance, a fire truck, a uh, hazardous material truck because there's fuel all over the road, whatever. You need to let that information be known. Now let's say the repeater's busy and there's a conversation going on. What you want to do is wait for somebody to finish and you'll hear a beep tone. That's called the courtesy tone. Now, what Dave didn't mention is common practice is when you unkey, you wait for the beep tone to go before the other party keys up. This allows people with emergency traffic a chance to get in and say, break, break, break. When you say that, all conversation comes to a halt. And somebody will respond and says, what is your emergency traffic? Give your call sign, the nature of the emergency, and again, all that essential information that the uh, uh, public safety people are going to need to know how to service that uh, particular problem. Now, there's a, a, uh, a point that I need to bring up. I brought this up last year. A lot of you, when you buy your handhelds, find that uh, there's guys out there or, or instructions on the Internet on how to broadband these things. Go out take a couple of diodes out or something like that. And the temptation is really great if you're on a couple of repeaters and you're not getting a response. Well, doggone it, I'm just going to dial up that San Diego County Sheriff's repeater and, and just go right to the horse's mouth and, and get help. The FCC rules say that in a life and death emergency situation, anything goes and you can do that. However, in San Diego County, you need to be prepared with a good lawyer <laughs> because the sheriff's department here is notorious. We know there was one case here several years back where a guy did that on a bicycle accident and the police, after they uh, handled the emergency, arrested the hand volunteer and uh, I think the FCC actually got into it and said he had no right to change the radio and there were a lot of violations. Is anything built within the hand Take away their life. Yeah, so in, in any case, uh, I, I think this uh, particular individual was able to beat the charges, but it was a difficult, expensive process for him. Ham Radio Outlet just about got put out of business because they were put, doing the modifications. They were told by the FCC that if it happened again, they would be uh, out of business. So they don't want to do that. Now, the second topic is what to do in an emergency. Um, it's a Sunday morning, about 9.30 in the morning, you wake up and you look out and you see four plumes of smoke. This is October 2003. And it, you, you know there's something big going on, what am I going to do? Well, it's not so much a question of what you're going to do, it's what you should have done before. And that's called training. This is a key point in doing emergency communications. We have all kinds of training programs available for hams. Uh, a good one, cheap, go down to AR, HRO and buy this book, Emergency Communications, 1995, and read it. That's a basic starter. There's training that is held by ARES, Jerry Koster. Is Jerry still here or he leaves? 
I think he got up and left. In the near future, coming to a public safety center near you, Jerry will present, be presenting a really nice course called an introduction to ARES and emergency communications. And uh, this is a course that you'll want to take. It's a condensed course. It'll be on a Saturday. It'll give you everything you need to know in a uh, very short form for doing ham radio communications in an emergency. Another good avenue is the AWR on online courses. They have three MCOM courses. I would suggest you take at least number one. Of course, it costs you $40 to take it online, but it's a very good course. If you take all three, you can get a little honor roll certificate. And I noticed this month that they listed all the hams in the United States that have taken all three courses. I, I'm on there. <laughs> <laughs> so is Tuck Miller, NC-16. And I, I was the only two I recognized uh, from San Diego. There are about 300 hams in, in the country that have taken all three courses. Um, Racy's has a lot of training. That's their, that's their main thrust, is train, train, train. And along with RACES, there is a course that is absolutely required if you're going to work with any public service people, and it's called SIMS ICS. And that stands for the Standardized Emergency System um, Incident Command System. It's uh, presented on a Saturday a couple of times a year. Um, you need a lot of coffee to get through it. It can get a little dry in places, but it's a, it's a good course. And you're going to need that course to be able to get through some of the police lines and stuff like that, whether you're in Racy's or Harry's or Red Cross or anywhere. Um, another good source of training is the Palomar Emergency Service Net, and this is held on Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. on the 146.73 repeater. It's affiliated with ARES, but it's got other organizations in it. We get some Racy's people checking in with information. And uh, any other, I think we've had MARA announcements, stuff like that. It's uh, one of the largest nests in San Diego County. I think there's 80 or 90 people on the check-in list. Um, you'll hear all kinds of announcements about public service, what's going in, on in the county with ARES, uh, meetings that are coming up, all that kind of information. It's a real good wealth of uh, information you'll get. Anyway, the original topic was what to do in an emergency. If you read the ARES alert on page three this month, at the bottom, it says, if the ground shakes or you see smoke or rising water or you hear reports on radio or TV, monitor the 146.73 and or 146.265 repeaters. Both have a PL of 107.2 for information and possible assignment. If you have packet, check the latest ARES bullet. So if you've had some training and you want to help, go to one of those two repeaters and there'll be a lot of emergency communications going on. We had that with 146.73 during the, the, the fires of 2003 and uh, there was a lot of assignments were given and information about where to go to get assigned. And that's all you really need to do. Yes, sir? 146. Yeah, 140. I think that's Lions Peak. It covers the southern part of the city, and the 14673 does the northern part of the county. Any other questions? Yes. I have a comment. Um, you're not always in radio range, not even do you always get repeater right away. You're on the highway. There's emergency. You see a wreck. Attendance sheet somewhere around. If you didn't get a chance to sign, there's one here on the podium. There are also HRO, that's the candy store.